Hey everyone, welcome to another awesome episode of Living Up in Lion City. This time around, we're going to talk about something that's only tangentially related to Singapore, but uh, I've been obsessing about this particular topic for quite a number of months, and um, you know, I just thought it'd be fun to share it with you guys. So, the topic of today's episode is, of course, uh, lions. Now, uh, a bit of background. Um, a couple of months ago during Chinese New Year, uh, we went to Sri Lanka on vacation and uh, it's an amazing place. You know, we um, great weather, um, awesome food. Uh, we got to see and do a lot of things uh, around the island and that is fantastic. I uh, had a really good time there. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in in Sri Lanka was the, the prevalence of um, lion symbolism all over the place. Now... Um, so the lion motif is is really strong in Sri Lanka. It's like uh, the flag has the lion. I mean, that's the that's the symbol of Sri Lanka. You can see it in the flag. Uh, and besides that, you know, there's these little things like you know the uh, depictions of lions in, in temples, in, in banners, and flags, and um, even the the majority population of Sri Lanka, the Sinhalese people. Um, you know, Sinhala means lion people, as it turns out. <clears throat> Quite similar to the uh, Sanskrit word for lion, Sinha, or Simha, or Singha. And, um, you know, more interestingly, there's the Sigiriya, which is uh, a giant monolithic rock in the middle of the island. Now, this is an ancient rock, which was then made into a fortress on the top. Now, the fortress is not there anymore, but you can see the foundations in the very top. Uh, you know, it's quite a climb to get up there, but it's fantastic. Now, um of the ruins of that particular fortified rock, you can still see, um, you know, carvings, uh, a giant lion claws, you know, carved in the side of the entrance, uh, on either side of the entrance. And um, apparently there was also a giant head on top of the entrance, but that apparently, you know, fell down. Um, so yeah, the, the lion motif is really, really strong. And um, the story of, of this particular fortress is that there was a particular uh, Sri Lankan king uh, called Kashyapa the first, and um, he violently took over the throne from his uh, father, and uh, transported, uh, like rather moved the capital from its uh, from the original location, which I believe is Anantapura, uh, and you know brought it to the top of this rock, which was meant to be like a secure stronghold, and thus he built this fort, and um, you know, and there's like tons of lion symbols all over the place um possibly to to represent um you know him as as a monarch as a king as a brave and fierce leader right now this got me thinking now sri lanka aside you know the idea that lions are a symbol of royalty um is, is spread across countries and, and cultures and um civilizations um for the longest time you know it's it's a near universal symbol and I, it got me thinking, like, well, what's the deal? What is it about lions that, you know, evoke a sense of royalty and, um, and encourage uh, dominion, uh, etc.? Like, you see it in the heraldry in European kingdoms of your, um, you know, those shields which have, you know, symbols of animals and all that. I mean, sure, there's like tons of animals all over the place, but lions hold uh, a special place in all of these, uh, in, in the heraldry, so to speak. Um, for example, that, that of England or France, uh, Sweden. Um, and these are places that lions have, have never lived. Uh, now, for context, um, lions have been found um, across of Central Asia, uh, India, um, the Middle East, North of Africa, and, you know, East and Central Europe. Now, there have been fossils of lions found uh, in Germany, uh, too. But, uh, you know, apparently the last one, they're presumed to have died out like 40,000 years ago. So it's kind of outside the realm of cultural consciousness of lions. So let's just, you know, set that aside for a bit. Um, at any rate, like an understand, understanding lions, I mean, you know, Europe didn't have uh, lions at the time. So like, where did these symbols come from? And why has lion, why have lions come to mean uh, these things? So um, 
you know, I, I was just, you know, going around Googling stuff. And, you know, the the most common explanation is generally attributed to how the lions behave in the wild. There's like tons of articles on the internet that talk about how, you know, a lion appears kingly because of its appearance. It, it, it stands out thanks to its mane. Now, I don't know, I tend to, I want to disagree with that because while it does have visual implications of looking like a crown, um, you know, a clump of hair alone does not make a king. You know, you, you need something more to warrant uh, a lion being called the king of the jungle. Um, Unlike what that Disney movie would have us believe. So, um, there are some other interesting traits, though, that could probably lend to this um, explanation, which is that lions are social. It's it's the only big cat that's social. Um, tigers, leopards, cheetahs, um, jaguars, they're all solitary beasts. Um, you know, they do things by themselves. They're, they're, they're salty creatures. and um, but, but lions like to stick around in groups. And they coordinate their hunting and feeding. So, um, on, on top of that, they are they're pack animals, and on top of that, they are territorial. And um, lions defend their territory by patrolling the boundaries of the domain. And you can see this, uh, like, and they learn this at a very young age. Like lion cubs learn this, um, you know, learn to do their beat around what they consider their territory. And so, I can see where the lion has come to be associated with. Um, dominion, so to speak. That said, I mean, are these natural behaviors really why the lion is widely considered to be a symbol of monarchy? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Because, you know, it, it, it goes back quite a bit. And so I want to start with, you know, I was doing a bit of reading about the lions in heraldry, like cultural depictions of lions and stuff. And um, one of the most prominent examples of lions in heraldry is the is the shields and the symbols of of Richard the First, um, you know, one of the kings of England, um, about a thousand years ago. Um, the earliest references to lions being associated with heraldry in Europe was either um, a dude called Geoffrey Plantagenet, Plantagenet, or William the Conqueror in the 11th century. So this is about a thousand years ago. Um, that said. Lions as royal heraldry was popularized by Richard I, also known as Richard the Lionhearted, who was apparently known for um, courage and stuff. And um, because of him, the symbolism of lions um, has since spread across, you know, other kingdoms and rulers, you know, like the ones in, in Sweden and Denmark where lions didn't exist. Now, the the symbol of Richard the Lionhearted can be seen today. Um, it is the three lions that are seen in you know English Premier League football clubs and stuff. It's the one of the most uh, enduring symbols of uh, the enduring. It's it is one of the most enduring national symbols of England, right now. So yeah, there you have it. Now, so I can understand how um, lions as a symbol in shields and heraldry, you know, spread across European kingdoms. Now, one interesting factoid that I chanced upon was the reference to a lion as a king. So the earliest reference to a lion being a king, you know, as the, the animal representing the king, is was found in a book called the Physiologus. It's a treatise or it's some sort of text that was that dates back to the t second or third century CE, and this is about you know eighteen hundred to nineteen hundred years ago, and it's essentially um, it's supposed to be um, a book about animals of the time, but it's not a scientific treatise. It it was like um, a book talking about these different animals with a lot of um, Christian and theological um, associations to these animals. So essentially, it's like in you know, a bunch of tales, um, you know allegorical tales, so to speak, uh, you know, describing these animals. So it's not exactly a biological or, uh, you know, it's not exactly a scientific treatise. But anywho, um, in one of the chapters, um, they talk about lions and um, the, the text distinctly alludes to the lion being uh, Jesus Christ. So... You know, there are different definitive comparisons made between the lion and, you know, the life of Jesus Christ. Um, the text is a little too dense for me to understand, but the commentary um, 
talks about this being a comparison to Jesus Christ, which is interesting because um, Jesus was also referred to as the Lion of Judah. And uh, the lion was the symbol of the Judah tribe, which was one of the um, 12 um, biblical tribes of Israel, at least as, you know, as far as um, the Bible says so. Um, I'm not too hot on which Bible or which particular, um, you know, a biblical mythology this comes from, but that's that's what I garnered from this so far. Um, so, yeah, like the lion was the symbol of this particular tribe of Judah, and uh, Jesus was called the Lion of Judah or the King of Judah or, you know, the King of the Jews, um, etc. So that was an interesting, you know, connect. Yeah, I, I just thought that was interesting in that... Um, you know, lions were like kings because of their comparison or because of their, um, because they're being compared to Jesus. Um, yeah, but that's, that's just, you know, it's just conjecture at this point and I, I don't really know too much about this. Um, it's worth noting that, um, um, you know, gladiatorial battles in Rome were popular at the time. So this is about the first to third century CE. So that's about a thousand years ago where um, gladiators where um, gladiators, uh, prisoners of war uh, and Christians were, were pitted against you know, wild animals, including lions. Now, this could possibly have, you know, th this is probably where stories of, uh, you know, Christians dealing with or you know being pitted against lions came to be uh, one of the, some of the more famous stories uh, in in you know biblical texts uh, I'm not sure which ones is uh, that of Daniel uh, there's a story of Daniel who was thrown into a den of lions but he somehow survived unscathed and there are some like associated allegories which I'll not go into uh, then there's also that story of of Samson uh, who um, killed a lion with his bare hands and then found like a hive of bees inside it. it it's yeah there's like a whole bunch of crazy shit in there um but this is interesting right so we're talking about two people who um survived lions and you know bested them in in battle so to speak and the story of samson especially sounds interesting because um i believe it's a callback to um the stories of hercules they're like the uh, the pagan legends of, of Hercules, you know. Um, from what I can tell, the earliest um, reference to Hercules and his tales goes back to 600 BC, which is 2,600 years ago. Um, is that, you know, Her Hercules kind of went through this hero's journey. So he had like, you know, 12 trials to um, overcome in his you know hero's journey and they're like you know levels and uh, one of the boss battles was was a lion you know it was called the nemean lion right so this nemean lion was apparently a lion that no mortal could kill um because of its impenetrable fur and um long story short you know hercules did so um the story about samson has a lot of similarities to hercules i mean at least in the fact that um it wasn't about the lion being brave or the lion representing bravery. It was about um, the person overcoming or defeating the lion that was considered fearless and all. And if I remember correctly, uh, Hercules then, you know, wears the lion's skin. You know, he wears like a stole and, you know, he puts, um, he, he wears the skull of the lion like uh, a helmet. And so, you know, he becomes the thing that he defeated thus fearless and and brave and perhaps a king i don't know but you know i think the king part is kind of covered with yeah i don't know now um and so this is this is where i think that you know it, it seems really obvious that defeating lions is a big part of the heroism and uh this could be where the ideals of courage and fearlessness came to be associated with lions but you know it, it goes deeper like connections with lions and kings goes further back in time to, to ancient Egypt. Here's the thing. Uh, lions were native to the North African region, at least back in the day. And folks knew that lions weren't to be messed with, you know, being the fearsome predators that they are, um, possibly the apex ones at the time. And uh, therefore, there's 
you know, it, it makes sense. There's, there's plenty of symbolism to suggest that ancient Egyptians feared and therefore worshipped the lioness. Um, a number of Egyptian gods are based off of a lioness and not the male lion, like Sekhmet, uh, the, the warrior goddess, the goddess of war, and, um, and, and Bast too. Although um, later depictions of Bast kind of softened the whole lion, lioness persona with that of a cat. So there's like an interesting uh, evolution there. Um, that said, you know, fear and worship of lionesses aside in ancient Egypt, uh, male lions, the ones with manes, were definitely associated with pharaohs, the ancient Egyptian kings. Like, their, their tombs were guarded by sculptures of the Sphinx. Uh, and so the Sphinxes, and therefore lions, were, were clearly representing kings at least until 1800 BC. Now, this is 4,000 years ago from present day. Right, so we have an allusion to lions representing monarchy at least four thousand years ago, and it goes deeper. Um, as it turns out, the oldest reference to lions with respect to kings in history goes to Gilgamesh, who is uh, a quasi historical king from ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, which is now modern Iraq and Syria. Uh, and this predates the ancient Egyptian civilization. Now, these civilizations were close by, so it stands to reason that the symbols and, you know, cultural references, you know, th there was some um, exchange or, you know, some movement. But yeah, so we can definitely assume that uh, lions as a symbol of monarchy um, can be attributed at its earliest to this dude called Gilgamesh. Now, the Mesopotamian civilization is, you know, it goes back to at least 10,000 BC. Now that's, that's like 12,000 years ago. So the lion is a really old cultural reference. Now, this is where it gets interesting though. Gilgamesh is often depicted in statues and sculptures as strangling a lion. Um, there's nothing regal or royal looking about the lion. Um, it's, it's generally portrayed as a helpless beast, uh, which is very unlike other depictions of lions thousands of years into the future. And this will be relevant in a bit, right? So uh, Gilgamesh uh, is immortalized in a bunch of clay tablets chronicling his adventures, and it's called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, this is possibly the oldest fan fiction in history. It's high fantasy, where uh, Gilgamesh goes through a series of trials now very similar to what Hercules went through. Although the stories are very different, but, you know, the themes, the themes of, you know, a guy um, going through trial trials to, you know, uh, become a hero in the end is, is it's, it's quite a similar uh, trope. Um, so one of these trials involves a boss fight with this goddess called Inanna. Now, in Mesopotamian culture, she was the goddess of love, um, of fertility and war. And get this. She is often depict depicted as riding a bunch of lions. Now, the story goes that Inanna propositions Gilgamesh, asking to be her lover. And um, Gilgamesh was like, yeah, fuck that shit. You treated your exes like crap, uh, if not killed them outright. And uh, Inanna just gets crazy mad, you know, and then she conjures up this vicious uh, half-man, half-bull hybrid uh, and then, you know, just does battle with Gilgamesh. Now, these two are like, you know, they're just duking it out. And it's a furious battle, but uh, Gilgamesh ultimately prevails and then uh, cuts off the bull's head and throws the bull's head right in Inanna's face and said something to the tune of, you know, you'll never control me. I think that's how it went down. Um, what I find really interesting about this tale, and it's not just me, this is based on all the reading that I've done too, is that there's a lot of discussion around the metaphor of this story. Um, some believe that uh, Inanna, the goddess, actually represented uh, a theocratic entity uh, that, that controlled and oppressed a lot of cities around Mesopotamia. Or at least, I mean, I'm assuming that's what they meant by previous lovers. Um, and Gilgamesh overthrew this theocratic empire and went on to rule over the land. Now, by theocratic entity, I'm going to assume it is something like um, the kind of hold that the Vatican did 
had over you know the European kingdoms a long time ago, I guess. So there was something similar that is possibly going on. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. Like the this particular tale in the epic is immortalized in those statues that we talked about earlier. The ones where you know Gilgamesh is just chilling out, looking cool, and uh, casually strangling a lion to his side. Um, so it wasn't a literal battle with the lion. It could be argued. Like, it was possibly a metaphorical victory over a theocratic oppressor represented by the lion, in this case, you know, Inanna. So, um, Gilgamesh is often seen portrayed in statues strangling a lion, stomping in them, possibly to signify how much he crushed the forces of Inanna. Uh, the battle may not have been literal, it may have just been Gilgamesh wresting control from the theological dominion in Ishtar, the city that he eventually came to um, rule. Um, so yeah, that, folks, is possibly where the lion symbolism came from, you know? It, it wasn't about uh, a lion or lions naturally being leaders or kings or brave uh, and courageous. It was just about a story where a lion represented something that um, a protagonist then defeated, thus, you know, breaking free from, you know, religion, dogma, oppression, etc., and um, that particular theme and that particular symbolism, you know, just transmuted into that of monarchy and leadership. And then it just spread across the world. Uh, the, the lion is one of the most uh, enduring symbols of, of human civilization, as it turns out. So it really turned out to be really interesting, you know, going down this rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, of course, this could just be me. You know, this is me just reading too much into things, as I generally do. Um, but that said, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, papers and other stuff that I was using as reference, and I'll put in the show notes and do have a look at it. Uh, it, it makes for really interesting reading. Um, it's it's often fun to make these you know historical connections, uh, whether or not those connections are are real is is another story entirely. But you know, it it makes for um, it's, it's pretty fun. Oh, so I guess I forgot to talk about um, lion symbolism in, in Asia. Now, it So here's the thing, right? The lions as a symbol were very prevalent in, in ancient India. Um, so there was uh, this old this Indian king called Ashoka, um, who was, yeah, like, who ruled at least around 250 BCE. So this was... Um, 2250 years ago um you know so he was a big proponent of buddhism and he spread uh, buddhism far and wide across the land oh wait you know what let me just take a couple of steps back right so we have uh, you know lions as a symbol of monarchy or at least of dominion and all that gilgamesh related jazz you know going on in in uh, central asia in mesopotamia uh, and then going down to egypt i presume and you know, there was this uh, migration from Central Asia over to uh, the north of India. And, you know, what is widely called the Indo-Aryan uh, migration. And uh, it was around this time that uh, Gautam Buddha was born. So Buddha is uh, was born uh, somewhere in India around 500 BC. So this was 2,500 years ago. And... Uh, you know, Buddhism caught on really quick. It was it was huge, and uh, you know, maybe like two hundred fifty years after uh, Buddha's death, uh, there was a king called uh, King Ashoka. Uh, he's quite well known in Indian history books uh, because uh, the story goes that he was a violent king, and you know he was um, invading every kingdom left and right. And in one particular battle, he was so, um, what's the word? He was. Yeah, he was deeply affected by uh, how much bloodshed was going on in, in all of his battles. And so after one particular battle, which is the Battle of Kalinga, um, he renounces, um, like he stops invading kingdoms, he takes up Buddhism, he becomes all about non-violence, which once again is the uh, tenet that we all know is attributed to Mahatma Gandhi. Um, so Ashoka embraces non-violence, and uh, he uh, goes on to spread um, the good word of Gautam Buddha 
uh, not just within India, but um, all over the immediate region. So he sent emissaries um, to, you know, spread Buddhism to um, Sri Lanka, to the north of India, to um, and onwards towards China, and um, and then from there it also goes to the Malay kingdoms. Yes, and this is mentioned. So, and we're talking about 250 BC. So we're like, there's a reference to Malay kingdoms um, at least 2,200 years ago. So um, that said, um, there's something very interesting about uh, depictions and portrayals of lions in Asia, notably uh, north of India towards China and, and you know, in the Southeast Asian region too. In that, um, lions didn't really look like lions. So, so have you seen those um, lion dances where you know you have this lion during Chinese New Year, and they don't really look like lions, you know? I mean, they're like stylistic lions, but apparently, uh, what they now call the lion dog is an art style that came about because people from the region, notably China and eastward had no direct visual reference to what lions looked like. And they were entirely basing their conception of lions in their art to um, depictions of lions from other places, like from India, or notably from the Persian Empire called the Sasanian Empire. Now, this was about 200 to 300 AD, where they had like major relations with the Chinese um, uh, kingdoms at the time. And apparently, um, a lot of art depicting lions in the Chinese kingdoms at the time directly derived from, uh, I mean, directly drew inspiration from, um, you know, the knickknacks shaped like lions that uh, these Persians had. So uh, thus, this brought about like the whole lion dog thing, you know, the ones with bulgy eyes, uh, weird teeth and flaming uh, manes, which are very different from, um, you know, Indian and European uh, depictions of lions, which are closer to what lions actually look like. So yeah, that was um, that was an interesting uh, bit of insight. Um, yeah, I guess uh, that was kind of what's been keeping me busy, uh, and uh, you know, I thought it's just kind of fun, uh, especially in light of the fact that. Um, you know, Singapore is kind of named after um, a lion allegedly spotted on its shores. Um, but, you know, seeing how lions have over tens of thousands of years been represented as something, you know, to describe monarchy or dominion, um, it does stand to reason that the lion that Sangal Uttama saw was more metaphorical than real. Um, and it's just like old people's way of saying that, hey, I'm the king now. Um, anywho, uh, guys, just, uh, you know, check out the references that I'm going to put in the uh, show notes. Um, I will put a little, um, I will write about it in a little more detail on the website, which I'm still in the process of, you know, cleaning up and stuff. But, you know, do have a go at it. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Some of the references are very dense. These are like some academic studies, but they have some like interesting tidbits and it, it was really fun to read. Um, so, yeah. Um, hope you liked this episode. Uh, you know, just uh, as you know, uh, we're on Spotify, iTunes, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and I hope you guys look forward to the next episode, which will be more related to Singapore than this one. So, peace out. <laughs> <laughs>